Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome back to my video series on the unforgivable sin. In my previous video, I examined uh, Romans chapter 1 and helped you to see that chapter in its proper context, with the focus being on the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the non-Jew. And I helped you to see that in light of chapters 2 and 3, that what, what is said about Gentiles here is true regarding Jews as well, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and God is not a respecter of persons, and all are in need of a Savior. And so I've, I've helped one to see the context of Romans chapter 1, and, and verses from, from verse 21 all the way until uh, verse 32, m many people have wrongly concluded that this is speaking of apostates, uh, people who have sinned to such a degree that they are now without hope, uh, people who have uh, been given over to a reprobate mind, and then uh, because they've been given over to a reprobate mind, there's nothing they can do to be saved. I showed you how that is not true, and I helped you to see that through chapters 2 and 3, which shed light on what is said about Gentiles here. Um, Jews are just as guilty as these Gentiles here. And in this video, I'd like to go into other passages of Scripture that reveal that people from this category, this general uh, Gentile guilt of sin and, and the downward spiral of sin among the Gentiles, that all of these things described here are described throughout the entire New Testament and pertain to uh, people who uh, were these things, but now Paul is saying you are born again, you have been converted, you have been saved from this reprobate mind, you have been saved from all these sins that you have committed. And that's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. When the gospel is preached, it can prick through uh, to the heart of man. It's the only thing that can get, get to uh, man's hardened heart. And that hardened heart uh, we receive when, uh, through sin. Um, and when we sin, our heart gets calloused, and we're now a slave to sin. We're now in bondage to sin. And that downward spiral of sin leads to um, all these horrendous things that um, we should be ashamed of. But when we get into that state of, of sin, uh, we have pleasure in these things because of that, that, that our hearts being hardened um, and the blindness of our hearts, that callousness. And so when the gospel can be preached to us and we can uh, hear it and it can prick our hearts, we have the opportunity to respond in faith to that gospel and see our stony hearts removed and uh, we receive a new heart of flesh where God can write his law in our hearts and um, our conscience is uh, cleaned. Uh, the filthy conscience that we had before is, 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 is cleansed and we can now uh, be renewed in the spirit of our mind. So everyone in this category of Romans chapter 1 can be saved, can be converted from this state uh, through Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel and having the blood of Jesus applied to our lives. So I want to show you how uh, the Word of God reveals very clearly that people in this, in, in this category can be saved, that there is hope for people and that hope is found in Jesus Christ. If you think that you're, uh, you've been given over to a reprobate mind, if you think that uh, you um, have sinned to such a degree, uh, knowing that something was tr uh, true but uh, going against th that truth, or knowing that something was wrong and ending up uh, choosing to, to commit that sin, um, I want to show you how there's hope for you in and through Jesus Christ. And... Uh, I want to begin by turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 9. Now, the Apostle Paul here, he's writing to uh, the church in Corinth. So he's writing to people who have already been born again. They've already been freed from bondage to sin and the, the blindness of their hearts due to that sin. And he says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners 
shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now this is powerful. He says, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So if we compare this list of what the Apostle Paul mentions here about how none of these people, fornicators, idolaters, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, this all points back to people from Romans chapter 1, homosexuality. Uh, it's describing people in, that were in that general uh, Gentile guilt of sin category. It's saying, look, these, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God, but he, he makes a powerful statement here in verse 11. He says, and such were some of you. In other words, you were one of those people. But, and that's a, that, here is a, usually when someone says but, it's a, in a negative way. Like you might say, make a, a good statement that say but, and then the, what, what's said is usually negative. But here he says negative information, and he says, and such were some of you. But, but now he's going to say something positive. You are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And this is the gospel right here. If we compare this with Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, this is the Apostle Peter preaching the gospel for the very first time under the new covenant after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, then Peter stood up and he preached the gospel that Jesus commanded him to preach. Then Peter said unto them, this was after they heard heard all that Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection, and they wanted to know what they needed to do. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here you have uh, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So the name of Jesus Christ is involved when we're baptized. And that's where remission of sins takes place because when we call upon the name of Jesus in faith in water baptism, the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives. That's where we're crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, and we resurrect with Christ to a new creation in Christ. And then we will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift that's given, but we need to receive it in faith. And so going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul says, "...and such were some of you, but you are washed." This is referring to water baptism. You're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. All taking place when you're calling upon the name of Jesus in water baptism, when you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of our God. So it's the Spirit of God that actually baptizes us into Jesus Christ when we get baptized by full immersion in water in the name of Jesus Christ. When we obey that command... That's where God does a work on our hearts. It's God who baptizes us into Jesus Christ. It's God who justifies us through the blood of Jesus that applies the blood of Jesus to us. All this is an invisible operation of God. And so this is pointing to the gospel. And so once we understand that, we can see that, wow, all the people from from this group, these horrible, uh, deceived, hardened hearts, blinded, uh, idolaters, He says, such were some of you, just like in Romans chapter 1. And so those of you who think that uh, you're in this situation and that this is a hopeless situation, that uh, you can't be saved once you're uh, found in this this, uh, group of people, that's a lie of the devil. I want to show you through God's word that uh, you, you have hope. You just need to understand the gospel. You need to hear the gospel, and then you need to respond in faithful obedience to the gospel. And then God will do a work. He's the one who will set you free from that reprobate mind, that rejected and unapproved mind. And you can be renewed in the spirit of your mind, as we're going to learn as we go uh, deeper into the New Testament. So these people here who ended up uh, dishonoring their own bodies between themselves... Um, it led to homosexuality among all these things right here. We just, we just saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 11, that many of the born-again believers in the church in Corinth were part of this category of people. And that's why he says, and such were some of you. So that's very powerful. It's something that we need to consider. It's something that we need to understand. Uh, and, the, and the entire New Testament is filled with examples like this. In my preparation of doing this video, as I was reading through God's Word and I was um, looking at all the, these things and um, looking at them in the Strong's Concordance, it, it, it took me to 
other passages of Scripture uh, that spoke of these same things. And I, I was amazed at, at how the entire New Testament has woven uh, the, the people in this group all throughout the New Testament and brought it together with the focus being on how these people can be saved in and through Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel, and they need to hear the gospel and respond in faith to the gospel. So I hope that this video removes any doubt from those of you who feel like you are without hope so that you can see uh, you do have hope in and through Jesus Christ alone. And so when we pay attention to Romans chapter 1, it, it's all focusing on idolatry. It's how it starts off. Uh, it says, When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, that, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then they created idols uh, made, uh, made like uh, four-footed beasts and creeping things. And um, that's what led to uh, all of these things. Uh, the, the deceitfulness of sin and the hardened hearts led to all kinds of, of evils. But when we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we were just in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, he's writing to born-again believers, uh, the church in Corinth, and he is writing to Gentiles who were born again, who were converted. And he makes a powerful statement here. He says, you know that you were Gentiles. It's a past tense. He's saying you were Gentiles. Now, it's interesting because from a physical perspective, from a bloodline perspective, they were, they were Gentiles. They weren't part of the Israelite lineage. They were Gentiles. Um, but he says, you know that you were Gentiles. Now, if we remember back to what we learned in Romans chapter 2, uh, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, those who had, have been born again, he says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So here he's saying that regardless of whether you're a Gentile or a Jew according to an outward uh, uh, physical perspective, like regarding lineage, bloodline, or circumcision of the flesh, he says, no, according to how God sees you, um, you're a Jew if you've been circumcised of the heart. You're a Jew uh, inwardly now. And so I believe that when the Apostle Paul is writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he says, you know that you were Gentiles, he's writing to Gentiles according to the flesh. But he knows that they're now Jews according to the Spirit because they've been circumcised of their hearts. And so he says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. Now, the, these dumb idols that carried them away and they were led that way, this is referring to idolatry in its various different forms. Exactly what Romans chapter 1 is describing uh, regarding these people who um, turn to idolatry. And the Apostle Paul was writing to them saying, you were one of these people, um, but now you've been saved. You've been circumcised of the heart. You're a true Jew in God's eyes. You're a spiritual Jew in God's eyes. You're part of the true Israel of God because you've had faith in Jesus Christ. And so there's so many examples like this throughout Scripture. I'm going to touch on a few more. And then I want to focus a video just on Ephesians chapter 4, comparing uh, the details of what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, with what Paul writes here, so that you can see a powerful revelation of how God's Word communicates to us that people in this category can most definitely be born again, be saved, be freed from bondage to sin, and, and uh, be renewed in the spirit of their mind. See the, the reprobate mind um, dealt with through the blood of Jesus. And then we can turn to Colossians chapter 3. I could read the whole chapter, but to save time, I'm going to read just the first 11 verses. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to the church in Colossae. He's writing to born-again believers. They've already obeyed the gospel. And he, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, now they were risen with Christ when they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul describes how when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death so that we can rise to walk in newness of life, um, uh, resurrecting with Jesus Christ to a new life in him. It's all spiritually speaking of the new birth. 
So if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. This is referring to the old man being crucified with Jesus Christ when we get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so uh, we can see that uh, it's, uh, verses 10 and 11 will confirm that as we continue reading. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. When we understand that the first resurrection is Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the first resurrection, and we need to take part in that resurrection in order to not be hurt or touched by the second death, which is eternal death. Revelation 20 talks about that. Um, we can see that that's all, all referring spiritually to what takes place when we're born again and we get baptized into Jesus Christ and rise to walk in newness of life. That's the first resurrection, and that's how we take part in the first resurrection. So when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So this is referring to when the Lord actually returns on the last day and the, and the general resurrection takes place, where the spirits of, of the dead will be resurrected with their new bodies and the judgment will take place. And those who are alive and remain on the earth will be changed with in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. We can read all about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so in verse 5 he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So all these things were, are listed in Romans chapter 1. And he says, now that you're born again, he's, again he's writing to the church, he, mortify your members which are upon the earth. So see them, see those things put under, because you no longer have to fulfill the, the the fleshly lusts and desires. You don't have to go down that road. Why? Because you're free. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he says, because of these things, for th for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience are the uh, people from Romans chapter 1 that Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3 reveal pertains to all unbelieving Jews as well. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's now talking about all these uh, sin sins of the flesh and how the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience that do these things just like in Romans chapter 1. They have pleasure in them that do them uh, but God's wrath is going to be poured out on, on those who, who hold the truth and unrighteousness and, and continue to do these things. And, he say, and, and so in verse 7, he then says, In the which you also walked. So he, he's now doing exactly what he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when he says, And such were some of you. He says, In the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. Other places in the New Testament, the King James writes, uh, your conversation, that's your lifestyle. That's, that's living in those things. Um, so this is all pointing back to that lifestyle of sin that Romans chapter 1 uh, was talking about. And he's, he's writing to born-again believers. He's saying, In the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So this points back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, how the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, both Jew and, and non-Jew, both Jew and Greek. And so the focus of Romans chapter 1 is on the gospel. And the focus throughout the entire New Testament when we, we look at these, these passages in their, in their full context, we can see born-again believers that were in that category of Romans chapter 1, but they have been born again. They have put off the old man in his deeds and have put on the new man. This all takes place when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We're baptized into the death of Christ. And we can read about that in Romans chapter 6. The Apostle Paul, and again, it's, this is all contained in the same letter that Romans chapters 1 through 3 uh, is found in. So uh, after that, all, Paul says all of those things in, in the first three chapters of Romans. He eventually gets to Romans chapter 6, 
where he says, Know ye not that so many of us as, as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? So why would we get baptized into his death unless he resurrected from the dead? So we need to get baptized into his death so that we can rise with him. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And this is putting on the new man. This is how, this is how we put on Jesus Christ. Um, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So this is all pointing to the freedom that we can have in and through Jesus Christ when we obey the gospel in faith. And that's what Colossians chapter 3 is referring to. And we can mortify our members which are upon the earth we can um, not give in to the lust of the flesh because by the Spirit we have power over sin when we're born again and we have a clean conscience and we can be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Whereas before, when we were dead in sin, our mind was completely given over to sin and uh, that reprobate, that rejected or unapproved mind was associated with the, the bondage to sin and our hardened hearts. Um, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the mind and the heart are connected. And uh, this is all due to uh, the deceitfulness of sin and us choosing to um, walk in disobedience. But that's the power of the gospel, to free and save someone from that state. And uh, this is what the New Testament opens up to us uh, so many places. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes here in Colossians saying, in the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But obviously, when you're born again, you stop living in them. Why? Because you're freed from that uh, bondage. You're freed from that reprobate mind. Uh, and God will save you from that. And by the Spirit, you can live a victorious life above sin, above death, and above the consequence of sin, which is eternal death. So I hope God is speaking to you through his word, helping you to see these things in a biblical light so that you can be freed uh, from uh, believing a lie. If you've placed yourself in Romans chapter 1, that category of people, and you feel that that is saying that you're now beyond hope, uh, there is hope in and through Jesus Christ. You just need to hear the gospel. You need to understand the gospel, and you need to respond in faithful obedience to the gospel, and you will be set free. You will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And uh, he will take away that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and write his law in your heart. Uh, that's the power of the gospel. But you need to understand the gospel so that you can actually um, have faith in the one and only gospel that saves, the gospel that the apostles preached. And then in Titus chapter 3, but I, I want to start in chapter 1. So here the apostle Paul is writing to Titus, and he says that there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, now, this is powerful because the people that uh, Paul is talking about here are the deceivers. They're the ones who are deceived themselves, and they're deceiving, and they're teaching horrible doctrines. It's not, uh, they're doctrines that are not of God. And uh, he's saying this witness is true regarding them, regarding the Cretans, but he says, rebuke them sharply. So he, he, he's writing to Titus, telling him to rebuke them sharply, obviously using the word of God, because that's the whole co context of what he's written earlier about using the word of God right here. And um, hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And so rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So these people who were deceived and they were deceiving... He's saying, uh, rebuke them using the word of God, 
that they may be sound in the faith. So they, they had hope, even though they were deceived and they were deceiving others, they still had hope in and through Jesus Christ. They just needed to hear the gospel. They needed to be corrected and rebuked with the word of God. And then in that's powerful because this sets the whole context for what we then read in chapter 3. And again, he's writing to Titus, so he's including himself, the Apostle Paul is including himself among uh, Titus when they were dead in their sins. He says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So the Apostle Paul is telling Titus, we were these things. This, this, this was us. The exact same people that he said you needed to rebuke and correct with the word of God in chapter 1 who were deceived and deceiving themselves. Paul's like, we ourselves also were sometimes th this. And, and this is the, the understanding that the Apostle Paul reveals in Romans as a whole, Romans chapters 1 through 3 especially. But he, he says, but, again, this is a positive statement now. This is a negative statement that we were these things. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, this is what, uh, what Jesus did, God manifesting in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So just like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, says that such were some of you. You, you were a part of all these uh, sins of the flesh at one time, but you are washed, but you are uh, sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He, uh, Paul is writing to Titus saying that we were these things. We were sometimes disobedient, foolish, all these things serving diverse lusts, just like Romans chapter 1, the, the lust of the flesh. But after the, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, after they understood and heard the gospel, um, that's when they were saved. And, he, and it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. So it's not like it's our own self-righteousness that saves us. No, when we obey the gospel, we're turning to Jesus Christ because we recognize that it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved, that we need his righteousness that is freely given to us if we receive it in faith. And we receive it in faith when we repent, get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is why he says, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. And I believe this washing of regeneration is referring to water baptism, being born of the water, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is referring to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, being born of the Spirit. This is pointing back to um, uh, how we're born again of water and spirit, which Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 um, lays it out very clear that after we repent, we get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. That's the washing of regeneration. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Um, and so all of this is pointing back to the gospel. It's, it's, it's interwoven throughout the entire uh, New Testament. And it all takes place through Jesus Christ, our Savior. But we need to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ by faith, all pointing back to the gospel. So let's get baptized into Jesus Christ so that we can see the old man crucified and buried, um, the sins of the flesh put under, our sins dealt with, washed away uh, in, in baptism by the blood of Jesus through faith. And then we can rise to walk in newness of life, a new creation having put on Christ. And then I want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. He says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So he just got done talking about the Old Covenant, that entire Old Covenant system under Moses. He's comparing it now to the New Covenant. And he's saying, for if that which is done away was glorious, it's referring to the, the old covenant, um, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And that's the new covenant established through the blood of Jesus Christ. So seeing then that we have such hope, all, all through Jesus Christ and what he did, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. So this is referring to 
um, uh, un, uh, the unbelieving back in Paul's day, their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So their minds, going back to what we read in Romans chapter 1, their minds being um, calloused or hardened, um, this is all pointing to the same thing, how the Jews that rejected Jesus Christ, they had um, a hardened uh, hearts, they had their hearts were blinded, their minds were blinded, all pointing to the same th- thing that takes place for rejecting Jesus Christ. And he says, but even unto this day when Moses is read, that is, that is the law, that is the Old Testament, the veil is upon their heart. Why? Because they haven't received Jesus Christ yet. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that is the heart of those Jews who, who didn't believe, when they, their heart turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is conveying what uh, I've conveyed regarding Romans chapter 1, that just like the Gentiles in Romans chapter 1, uh, given over to a reprobate mind, their mind was, was blinded, um, their heart, hearts were hardened. All this is connected together, um, but th- it didn't mean that they were without hope because they had a reprobate mind. No, they needed to hear the gospel so that they can be converted, that they could be born again and be renewed in the spirit of their mind. Just like these Jews here who had whose, whose minds were blinded. Why? They were blinded because of unbelief. They had hardened their hearts towards the truth, that is Jesus Christ. But just because they did that, did not mean that they didn't have any hope. That's why he says, nevertheless, when their hearts, it, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So that veil that's over their eyes, that's blinding their minds, can be taken away if they just understand the gospel and their need to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and obey the gospel in faith, seeing their old man crucified, buried, and so they can resurrect to a new life in Jesus Christ. And they can be renewed in the spirit of their mind from this blindness that takes place through unbelief. So all of this is intertwined, connected together, helping us to see that Jews and Gentiles are in the same situation where they've sinned and come short of the glory of God and all are in need of a Savior. And this is why all need to hear the gospel and all need to understand the gospel. Not a modern day uh, twisting of the gospel, which would be a, a false gospel, which would be a another gospel that the Apostle Paul warned about, but the actual gospel that the apostles preached that we see throughout the book of Acts, and uh, we can we can see it confirmed in all the letters to the churches, how they were born again, um, and it all points back to uh, repenting, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of sins, and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, it's important to understand the gospel in its entirety and when we do, and we, we go back to Romans chapter 1, we can see that that's the heart and center of what the Apostle Paul is writing about in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, the non-Jew. And then it goes on describing the non-Jew uh, a general Gentile guilt of sin and how that leads to being given over to a reprobate mind. But there's hope for those people. There's hope for these people, uh, and that is the gospel. They can turn to Jesus Christ and be set free and be renewed in the spirit of their mind. And so I had originally planned on going into Ephesians chapter 4, but I felt that these passages were really important to turn to to help you to see that people from this category of Romans chapter 1 were able to hear the gospel, obey the gospel, be set free, be born again, and be renewed in the spirit of their mind. And so this reprobate mind was dealt with through the blood of Jesus, and uh, they could then live a victorious life by the Spirit and see the, all the, these things of the flesh mortified by walking after the Spirit and not after the flesh. I just pray that you'd continue to read through the Word of God uh, with, with this understanding, allowing God to show you other examples where people in this category uh, were set free, were born again, were transformed and uh, therefore giving those of you hope who thought that you were in this category, therefore that there's nothing that you could do to be saved. You can now see that that's a lie of the devil, and um, you can be set free. And that's the whole point of this channel, is to help people to see where 
uh, they have believed a lie. Uh, many doctrines can lead to other false doctrines. And um, just to see uh, all the false doctrines that in modern times people have just accepted as fact, um, to dig a little deeper, to look in God's Word to see how that's not the case. Um, Romans chapter 1 and those given over to a reprobate mind is in no way referring to apostasy. This is not referring to an apostate who's given over to a reprobate mind. Uh, again, they were never in covenant with God to begin with. So I, I pray that you watch this entire series. I, I stress that I try to stress that in each video of the series. If you're just tuning into this video, you'll watch this entire series that I'm going to post at the end of this video, and you'll see the the bigger picture by um, watching this series as a whole. So I will see you in my next video where I'm going to go into Romans chapter 1 and compare it with Ephesians chapter 4, specifically verses 17 through 19, where we can see that the terminology that Paul uses here in Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 21 through uh, 32, Paul uses it in Ephesians chapter 4 and how it was referring to born-again believers that used to be part of this category of people but they were uh, made new through Jesus Christ. Uh, they were renewed in the spirit of their mind, and um, they no longer have a reprobate mind. Um, and that should give all of you hope who have felt or believed that this was referring to someone that is beyond hope, that someone who, someone who cannot uh, receive forgiveness because they have uh, made choices that um, put them in a place of irreparableness. That's so far from the truth. So may the truth set you free as you receive what God is speaking to you through his word. And I'll see you in my upcoming video. All right, God bless.